Good morning. Thank you for coming. And welcome to Commemoration Memorial Day here at Mason Point. Today is Memorial Day, but next week on the 6th is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. So today we're going to talk about both Memorial Day and D-Day. So I appreciate you coming. And right now, Chaplain is going to give an invitation. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Between 1775 and 2024, the U.S. military recorded roughly 1.3 million fatalities. Men and women signed up for to do their duty. Is any? It's difficult for them. We think way back 17. That's a long time for 1.3 million fatalities. We wonder how many more, Lord. We cry out with the psalmist, how long? But we take heart in the words of the prophet Micah. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, Today our hearts remember those who have fallen. Though we cannot know every name and face, we know that you know every one of them and the ultimate sacrifice they made on behalf of our country. They gave their own lives. On this day, we ask that you remind us of the great cost they paid and the privileges they have afforded us. We recall family members and friends of those who have lost their lives. We think of children, who have lost parents in the service of our country. We remember the grief they continue to live with. We ask that you enfold your children in love and comfort them in their sorrow. Be with those who mourn the loss of their loved one. We pray that you surround them with your loving arms. Bring them your peace today and every day. May they find comfort in the hope that is in Christ Jesus, of whom Scripture says there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Great is the love of our Lord. Father, we know Christ has victory over sin, death, and the devil. Let us remember these are the dead and the most precious gift they have, life itself, for loved ones, for neighbors, for comrades, for country, for us. Be with us, O Lord, as we lean into your promise. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain David. Um, very much appreciated. We have a quite large crowd here today, which is really really makes me feel good. Thank you for coming again, and we'll go on with the program. Now, this is a little bit of background on Memorial Day, and I apologize because those in the back will not be able to read this, most likely, and I will tell you what it says. But this is sort of a help for me so I don't forget something. Before I go any further, please silence your phones. Thank you very much. So anyway, Memorial Day was established back in May 3rd of 1868. That was three years after the Civil War ended. And it started out to be, or it was developed or thought of by Union veterans of the Civil War and they established May the 30th as what they call Decoration Day. I know I remember when I was a kid, we would go to the cemeteries on May the 30th and decorate the graves. So this is how it started. And then after World War I, 
it was expanded to include veterans of all wars, all American wars. And some, somewhere along the line, it, the name was changed to Memorial Day. Now, in 1868, Congress passed a, a law, and it was called Uniform Holiday Monday Act, which changed the date, or the, the day of Memorial Day, to Monday, the last Monday in May. And that's been the date, and today is the last Monday in May, the 27th. So that's how it got to be Memorial Day in 2024 from May 27th. Now, in uh, earlier in 18 or 1923, Congress established the American Battle and Monuments Commission, and that's an independent agency of the United States government responsible for administering operating and maintaining <coughs> over two dozen, I think the number is 26 American military cemeteries in around the world. Now we're going to hear from the uh, super seniors, world famous <laughs> super seniors, <laughs> from the Mason Point, directed by P.C. or Kelly, Kelly, I'll get it right, Kelly Habers. Close enough. I'm going to steal your mic. Hank's our biggest fan.
And our veterans and the choirs, since you stood for the whole thing, why don't you just wave? And <laughs> <laughs> just wave. Okay. And well, wasn't that a great performance? Yes. And, uh, and the very patriotic uh, uniforms they have on. <laughs> Just simply great. Maybe they're not world famous, but they're certainly very, very good. And by the way, if you're interested in joining this historic group, uh, there's a list of the members on the back of your program, I believe it is. So I suggest you contact one of them and they'll more than welcome you. It has been expanded a bit over the last year or two, but they're always looking for more singers. So here's your chance. Now, I talked earlier about the, uh, or I mentioned the uh, commission the Mon Battle Monuments Commission that was established in 1923. And it has uh, responsibility for the administration, the maintenance, everything to do with the American military cemeteries around the world. So I'm going to uh, play a little bit of, a little video here about the ABMC, that commission, and give you more of an idea of what they do. See you. Roosevelt and I 
have always believed that where the tree falls, there let it lie. We greatly prefer that Quentin shall continue to lie on the spot where he fell in battle. Their wishes were honored. Families were given the choice. The remains of their loved ones could be brought home or buried overseas. My grandparents opted to leave my father's body in Belgium, and I'm really glad they did. I can't think of a more beautiful place for him to be. It was appropriate for him to be near the men he fought with. And they both decided that let him be where he died, with his buddies that he died with. General John Pershing was the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. After the armistice, he and others worked to find a way to commemorate the American dead. In 1923, an act of Congress created the American Battle Monuments Commission. Its mission was simple, but difficult, to honor the service, achievements, and sacrifice of thousands of fallen Americans on a continent far away. The new agency's initial role was to construct monuments paying homage to the achievements of the American Expeditionary Forces. Soon after, the ABMC was given the additional task of building chapels at each of the American military cemeteries in Europe. The agency helped design and landscape these burial grounds, creating places of special beauty and serenity. In 1930, the United States government began sponsoring an extraordinary kind of pilgrimage. It invited Gold Star mothers and the widows of soldiers killed in action to visit the final resting places of sons and husbands. Veteran army officers acted as tour guides. Over 6,000 Gold Star pilgrims found solace and closure in these journeys. Back then, travel was very expensive and very difficult, so for these widows and mothers, it was the first and probably last time they would visit their loved ones' graves. And so we had to make sure that we escorted them and gave them what they needed to visit the graves. In 1934, the role of the ABMC changed forever. President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued an executive order making the agency responsible for maintaining American military burial grounds overseas. This assignment has been carried out with meticulous devotion ever since. Today, the American Battle Monuments Commission maintains World War I burial grounds, memorials, markers, and monuments across Western Europe. People from many nations are a major part of the agency's work and spirit. The American government takes care of everything here, but we can't do that without our local workers, no matter what country we're in. Their connection is very strong. We have several second generation employees here whose fathers worked here as well. And we can really see what the staff here does. They put their hearts into it and, and care for the grounds and the headstones and the markers of all the individuals here. They are out in the weather. No matter what, if it's hot, if it's freezing cold, rain or snow, they are out there taking care of all the cemetery grounds. Everything you see over there is taken care of by the crew, and I am really proud of what they can do. World War I was called the war to end all wars. It brought so many new technologies of destruction. It cost so many lives that many believed another global war would be impossible. But the idea of lasting peace turned out to be a forlorn hope. Just a generation later, America and the world were again forced into war. This time, the United States countered aggression and inhumanity in both Europe and the Pacific. More than 400,000 Americans gave their lives. When men ship out for war, they have to understand the gravity and what's ahead. But I would think he was probably hoping he would get home to his wife and daughter and family. That I'll do my job and then I'll come back. It's a circumstance that had to be debilitating to most of our men, and yet they persevered. They laid down their lives, they sacrificed literally everything for unknowns. They gave freedom to the world. Today, the ABMC maintains memorial sites and burial grounds, 
in over two dozen places in Europe, Africa, and the Pacific to honor those who served in World War II. Cemetery, 
right here on a bluff high above the coast is one of the world's best known military memorials. These hallowed grounds preserve the remains of nearly 9,400 Americans who died during the Allied liberation of France. Three Medal of Honor recipients rest here. 45 sets of brothers lie side by side. The Visitor Center describes the events and the significance of the D-Day landings and the ensuing campaign for Normandy. Every year, over a million visitors come to pay their respects to the fallen and learn more about the crucial events that happened here. Within the picturesque trees, an immense array of headstones rises in long regular rows. At the west end of the cemetery, granite statues represent the United States and France. A small chapel sits at the center of the cemetery. Inside, a ceiling mosaic depicts America blessing her sons as they depart to fight for freedom. In the open arc of the memorial, a bronze statue symbolizes the indomitable spirit of American youth. Over 1,500 names are carved on the walls in the Garden of the Missing behind the memorial. The daunting challenges and intense combat of the campaigns to liberate France live on in this inspiring burial ground, the final resting place for so many courageous American servicemen and women. That second video was, as they said, the Normandy American Military Cemetery. And Mary and I have been there a couple of times. And it is a very somber and uh, sacred place, I think. There are 9,389 graves there of uh, Americans who were killed either on D-Day, of which there were about 4,400, or the rest killed during the rest of the liberation of France. So I would, if you get an opportunity, I would uh, suggest that it is a great uh, American military cemetery to view. It's on the, to visit. It's on the bluff right above Omaha Beach, the bloodiest beach during D-Day. And it's, uh, it's just spotless, like this one lady was saying. It's perfect. You don't see any soda cans or cigarette butts even, or paper from wrappers of candy. It's just totally, just totally perfect. You can't enter without disposing of those items. You can't carry them on the cemetery. But I would, uh, really encourage you to think about that. The cemetery, as I said, is located on the bluff right above Omaha Beach. And from uh, the bluff area, you see the bomb craters that the bombers were delivering bombs to prior to, just prior to the troops uh, storming the beaches. And uh, also, Point du Hoc, which a number of you may have heard of, which was this sheer wall that the Army guys, Special Army guys, were trying to climb to access the beach in that area. And they were being shot at from German soldiers standing on top of the bluff, shooting straight down at them. And it's, it's really a place where you can understand and view somewhat what really happened during D-Day. And I think the American Battle Monuments Commission has done a great job with that cemetery and 25 others. And one of those 25 others is the cemetery at Meuse Argonne, which is a World War I battlefield. And two of our residents, Tom Schrader, and Velma Rourke's father fought in that battle. And he was injured and lost his left leg as a result. 
Uh, so we have some ties to these. I had uh, a uh, uncle who uh, was in the second wave on Utah Beach as a medic. And I'm sure probably a number of you have relatives that have probably participated in D-Day or somehow were involved in World War II. But I hope if you get an opportunity, we'll take advantage of that to go visit some of these places. And I highly recommend, recommend the one at Normandy. And I said we've been there several times, but we kind of have an ulterior reason for going there. Also, our daughter-in-law is a French lady, and she was born and raised in the Normandy area, not far from the beaches. So, but you don't need that excuse to go visit, because we've been there before we had the daughter-in-law. So anyway, I think that uh, Normandy Cemetery is kind of a lead into D-Day. And I want to start with that now. So I'm going to show a video here of Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower giving a talk to his troops prior to sending them to assault the Normandy Beachhead. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeat in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home front has given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all receive the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Okay, this is a uh, kind of a, a view from the air, if you want to call it, of the, of the uh, things going on in the day. You can see there's uh, three countries involved, and there were five beaches. The U.S. had two, the Brits had two, and the Canadians had one. The other, the flags by the planes just are signifying that there were a lot of planes, bombers, and uh, other planes flying in, and uh, so there were involvement other than the soldiers on the ground. So Utah, Utah Beach was a beach that I had an uncle, Ray, who was in the second wave on Utah Beach, and he was a medic, and he had survived the war, but uh, he had a lot of PTSD problems at night in particular. Uh, Omaha was the bloodiest, and that's the one that's right, right by the uh, American Military Cemetery at Normandy. Now, the, uh, there's a couple of uh, a couple of uh, places that we've been. 
the common or the one right hand there were appointed as an excellent, excellent uh, museum covering D-Day. It's superb. And I would, if you go to that area, I would certainly hope you would stop there. <coughs> There's another museum right here at St. Maria Galice. And that is uh, devoted to the air, the, the air war. And if you may have seen pictures of a soldier or paratroopers hanging from the church steeple with his uh, parachute, that's the town where he was. And there's still a, last time we've been there, there's still a mock-up of this soldier hanging by a parachute. Now that soldier, I think, survived. Wow. They quit, the you know, Germans were, when, when the paratroopers landed, they unfortunately went into an area that was very full of a lot of German soldiers there. So they went sort of into a beehive. And they were, a number of lost their lives there. And uh, the um, uh, soldier, the paratrooper that was hung up by the steeple, they kept shooting at him, and he uh, was waving, trying to free himself. He wasn't able to do that, so he just finally quit moving, and they quit shooting, he figured he was dead. But I think he actually survived, as I, as I recall. So anyway, that's the overview of um, Operation Overlord, which is what they call what they call this whole operation the landings or part of it. Now what I thought I'd talk about a little bit were innovations that were were applied in on D Day. These had not been employed elsewhere, or at least not the scale on D Day. So I'm going to talk to some of these. There was a uh, tide predicting machine, believe it or not, that uh, was in existence, but not very accurate. And there was a British mathematician that went to work on improving that. And he uh, identified the best timing to Eisenhower, the best time to storm the beaches was between the 5th and 7th of June, because Eisenhower wanted clear skies and full moon for visibility, calm sea, and low tides, because that would enable the, the troops landing in the boats to see the obstacles the German had placed that would be underwater at high tide. So anyway, June the 6th then was the, the, the D-Day date, which falls right in line with what, what they were telling, what the uh, mathematician's uh, machine was telling him. So anyway, now I'm going to talk about some of these additional ones. In the landing crafts were boats that uh, could run up on the beach, and uh, at least very near the beach, and, uh, the, and troops could get off and not have to wade through water over their heads. Basically, they went up on the beach, the front flapped down, and they walked off. They, uh, these, these boats were built by a person uh, Andrew Higgins, and they were called Higgins Boats. Andrew Higgins was a boat designer and builder in, uh, in uh, New Orleans area. And he, uh, he got a lot of business from the, uh, the troops, the army, to build these boats. And they were of various sizes, and they were shallow draft boats that were perfect for what Eisenhower wanted. 
and they uh, actually there uh, there is a museum in New Orleans, World War II Museum, which I encourage all of you to go if you haven't visited. It's composed of multiple buildings. I've been there a couple of times, and that's uh, where Stephen uh, Stephen Ambrose, who wrote the book D Day. He and Andrew Higgins, the boat builder, got together and they decided they were going to build a museum to Hayden's boats. Well, they, before they actually got started on that, their scope changed to a D-Day museum, which actually happened. And I'm a charter member of that from 2005. But the D-Day Museum later, the scope was changed to include the war in the Pacific. So they have a complete World War II, uh, many, many uh, things you'd like to see if you're interested in World War II. They have the road to Berlin, the road to Tokyo, Tokyo displays there. So this is a museum that I think uh, is very worthwhile seeing. So that's the Higgins Boats. Now also, the Allies uh, wanted to make sure they didn't run out of fuel in the D-Day invasion and further fighting in, the, uh, on, 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 in France to get rid of the Germans and, and uh, to liberate the French from the Germans. And this was a, uh, they called it Pluto. And Pluto pipeline under the ocean. Well, it really wasn't a pipeline under the ocean. It was a pipeline under the English Channel. But the fuel went from fuel depots in uh, Britain directly to French. Uh, the Normandy coast, a lot of it. And that was in operation uh, during part of D-Day and maintained in, op in operation for all the fighting through France. Now, there were multiple Plutos and multiple lines under the channel. I think there were 17 in total. So this was a big help, obviously. Now, you may have heard about the gliders. A lot of the uh, soldiers came in on gliders. These gliders were towed by uh, on a operational airplane. Could be a bomber or some other. And they uh, tow them across the English Channel. All of the stuff came from Britain. And they cut the tow rope, and these pilots of the gliders we're trying to find a reasonable place to land. These gliders were very flimsy. There were wood and canvas. And when they landed, there were a lot of trench landings. And, uh, but there were a lot of troops that were conveyed in addition to heavy equipment, like jeeps and tanks and so forth, that uh, they couldn't parachute in. And then they, they, uh, they dropped up a number of, uh, I call them special tanks. They were, one of these was a duplex drive tank. That's the one on the left top. And that tank was propelled in the water by props, like a boat, and on land by the tracks. And they had somehow put enough around that tank to basically let it swim, not drowned, in the water. Another tank was a, uh, a uh, crab mine clearing tank. It had, uh, as you can see on the other photo, a lot of uh, flailing arms out front to uh, to, to, know, uh, to, to set off the mines well before somebody actually got on it and got hurt. And they had also a, they call it a 
crocodile flamethrower tank, and they had a carpet layer tank. That tank had a bobbin on the front and uh, unspooled and laid carpet for the tanks and the trucks and vehicles so they wouldn't sink and drown in the sand, basically. And then another, another innovation, they used outdated ships and uh, other things that they laid a road over so that the trucks and uh, heavy equipment could drive across this water bridge, if you will, and, and uh, obviously participate in D-Day and further action in Normandy. And finally, there was these crickets, which probably a lot of you haven't heard about. When the paratroopers landed, of course, they weren't all landing in the same spot. They were scattered around. And so they were each given one of these crickets to communicate. So once they got on the ground, they could signal one another without getting on any kind of communications that might be interrupted or intercepted by the, the Germans. So this became very important for them to gather and move on. Now, I want to talk, before I talk about the slide, I want to just mention that a little bit of facts of D-Day. The, um, the armed forces, there were more than 150,000 Allied troops from the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and they also had some free French, free France and Norway participation. There were the Armada, if you want to call it that, which is the biggest invasion fleet ever. They had 6,000 ships and landing craft, 50,000 vehicles, and 11,000 planes. So you can imagine they needed these Pluto under the English Channel uh, uh, lines to fuel these. Now the casualties in uh, these include killed, wounded, missing, or captured. The United States had over 8,000. United Kingdom had almost 3,000. Canada had over 1,000. And uh, the actual Americans killed them, they were about 2,500 of the 4,400 Allied troops that were actually killed on D-Day. So anyway, on June the 11th, the beachheads that were accomplished on D-Day were firmly secured and more than 326,000 Allied troops had crossed with more than 100,000 tons of military equipment, which resulted in Paris being liberated on August the 25th and Germany surrendering on May 1945. So was it worth it? Well, it wound up ending the war. Yes. We have the choir, the amazing choir coming up. Thank you, Hank. I always feel like I learned something every time Hank talks. So we would like to uh, conclude our program this afternoon with Amazing Grace. And we'd like to say a big thanks to everybody who's had a part. Um, Hank for putting this together. Um, Chuck. Chuck. Joe? Chuck. Chuck. Chuck, the videographer. Our videographer. <laughs> Bill, go ahead and come on. And uh, Nancy with our beautiful program. And Beth has to try to wrangle everybody onto the same page. That's always, that's always a fun job. <laughs> and Kelly, our choir director. Yeah. So since Memorial Day is the unofficial kickoff to summer, choir will be presenting a fun in the summertime concert later this week. So I'm on Touchdown, and on, it's on Thursday. And, um, 
be prepared for some fun in the summertime. It'll be a, a lot less uh, formal than our occasion today. So we'd like to conclude this morning with three verses of Amazing Grace, which should be in the back of your program. If you would like to sing along with us, we'd love to have you join us for Amazing Grace.